Now, they are paying a visit to the venue of Canton Fair. It serves as China's first and foremost platform for foreign trade. So, Jianhua and uh, Lindy, I mean, personally, I was working at the Canton Fair about 20 years ago. I bet a lot of changes have made there. It was very popular among foreign traders. So, what have you seen there? Yes, Jun Fong, it's very popular among foreign traders, but before we get started, I think you have noticed I have new co-host today, and let me give you Lindy. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jun It feels amazing to finally be joining the new China series tour. Of course, quite enjoying so far what we're experiencing here in the southeast, although it is incredibly hot today. It's really hot. We're standing <laughs> in the heat right now. Yeah. So this is day three of our mammoth trip across southeast China, and today, we're in the southern Chinese city of Guangzhou, the front line of China's reform and opening up. Oh, that's absolutely correct. China's economic miracle has long been attributed to its opening up and reform policies, specifically over the past 40 years. But what fueled such growth and which industries enabled the country to become the world's second largest economy? Well, CGTN's Omar Khan takes a look at China's foreign trade and how it's changed over the years. In 2013, China bypassed the United States as the world's largest trader of goods. An impressive triumph given that in 1950, China's trade volume of goods was a mere 1.1 billion U.S. dollars. By the end of 2018, that number sat at 4.6 trillion U.S. dollars. And although China has now shifted its efforts toward a service-oriented economy, foreign trade will continue to play a pivotal role. If you look at the foreign trade, uh, it has in trillion dollars. Uh, it is difficult to imagine foreign trade has been replaced by the services overnight or in one year, two years. It is a process and the process would take even a couple of decades. China's annual trade growth remained below 10 percent between 1950 and 1977, the years of a planned economy. But following the opening up and reform, trade grew at an average of 14.5 percent. Accounting for global trade totals, China's share expanded from 0.8% in 1978 to 11.8% last year. But given recent trade tensions with the U.S. and a move away from traditional manufacturing, what does that mean for those doing trade with China? I have no doubt that foreign investors will continually come to China, but, uh, but probably they may change their, their focus. So I think uh, 20 years ago, they were thinking of China just a uh, uh, manufacturing hub, providing low-cost uh, product, uh, uh, products. And now they are seeing China with uh, you know, increase of middle class. And also, it, it, that's a huge market in terms of populations. So you can find people, they are looking for good quality, middle-level uh, quality. So every, I think every new uh, investor, they will find the, the, the suitable marketplace for them to explore. Over the past several years, companies have relocated out of China in search of cheaper trading hubs. Regardless of this reality, however, China's role in global supply chains and value chains remains unchallenged. Not all the cases are successful. You know, uh, they are still suffering that uh, from, you know, difficulty of sourcing from the local market because China still, you know, it's a biggest supply chain in the world. So you, you probably for close, you, you have problem to find some little accessory in order to finish the whole product. So they still need to sourcing from China and only focus on the production in Vietnam or Cambodia. In the first half of this year, foreign trade expanded by 3.9 percent year on year, with total volumes reaching just over 2.1 trillion U.S. dollars. China's central and western regions continue to play an ever-growing role, as their trade grew by 14 percent during the first six months of the year. China has signed a total of 17 trade agreements with some 25 trading partners. And with trade between Belt and Road countries and the ASEAN bloc both witnessing year-on-year -year increases, it's hard to imagine that China's expertise in both import and export will be displaced in the near future. Omar Khan, CGTN, Guangzhou. As we're here in Guangzhou, Canton Fair here attracts many international traders and we are joined by Yu Yi, Deputy General Manager of the International Communication Department of China Foreign Trade Center. Welcome, Mr. Yes, indeed. Yu. Welcome very much to the program. Now, of course, over the past six decades, uh, the Canton Fair has gone through its own transformations, its own reform. Talk us through what it's done over the years and what its role is today. 
Yeah, okay. It's my pleasure to have this interview. Uh, established in 1957, and Canon Fair is held every spring and autumn in Guangzhou. It is a comprehensive international trade event with the longest history, the largest scale, the most complete product variety, and the largest buyer attendance, the broadest distribution of buyers source country, the greatest business turnover, and the best reputation in China. Canon Fair is regarded as a barometer of China Foreign Trade Center. center. It is the winner, epitome, and symbol of China's opening up. Since its founding, Canon Fair has never been interrupted. It has made important contributions to economic development of the new China, reform and opening up, and China's transformation to a big trading nation and a strong trading power. In the face of establishment, Canon Fair opened a door of foreign economic and trade exchanges for the new China and own foreign exchange capital urgently needed for national development. In the face of exploring development, Canon Fair has served China's reform and opening up, and through optimization of exhibitors and products, more and more Chinese companies step onto the stage of foreign trade. In the face of thriving development, Canon Fair promoted made in China Chinese companies and brands to go global and became the most vital channel for these companies and brands and to expand to overseas markets. It has made important contributions to China's becoming a large trading nation. In the face of high quality development, Canon Fair has been committed to serve the big picture of foreign trade development. China's all around opening up a major party and state strategies. It is shifting towards a comprehensive and multifunctional platform of opening up to sell to and buy from the world and will make new contributions to building China into strong trading power. And Mr. Yu, it does have a history of over 60 years, right? So I really want to ask this question. How about uh, Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, the Greater Bay Area? What role does it play right now in this day and time? Uh, since its founding, uh, Canton Fair has been rooted in Guangzhou, the city center of Greater Bay Area. As China's number one fair, and Canton Fair has enhanced its uh, growth impetus and dynamics over the years, and made its due contribution to drive the transformation and upgrading of enterprises in the area. And deepening cooperation between the mainland, and Hong Kong, and Macau, and Canon Fair has advanced transformation and upgrading of enterprises and the international presence. The 1925th session of Canon Fair attracted 3,407 exhibitors from uh, this area, accounting for 13.7% of the total number. Uh, numerous companies in this area uh, have grown from small companies into big and strong businesses. Canon Fair uh, has also explored the Hong Kong and Macau market to deepen economic and trade cooperation with the mainland. Buyer attendance of Hong Kong and Macau has always ran among the top. Uh, Canon Fair has served the Bell and Road Initiative and also promoted uh, integration of business resources within, the, within and outside the Greater Bay Area. At present, Canon Fair has established partnership with many chambers of commerce and industry organizations in countries along the route. Um, buyers from BRA countries and regions account for about uh, a half of the total numbers with an increasing trend. In the meanwhile, uh, the, uh, over 8,000 companies um, from BRI countries uh, att have uh, exhibited at the Canon Fair becoming the largest exhibitor group in our international pavilion. That's mm -hmm. really impressive yeah. indeed, isn't it? That's great. Right. Yeah, from yeah. its yeah. history, it's still clearly growing bigger and bigger and further and further. That's great. Right. And the 126th one, the yeah. Canton Fair, is about to happen in October, right? Yeah. Now, of course, yes. there are plenty of other fairs now in China, for example, in Shanghai. But the thing is, no one or business representative has missed the chance to show their products here. Yeah, okay, so now let's turn to our colleagues in Southwest China, our colleagues in Kuomei. We'll talk about Yunnan's foreign trade. So hi, Sean and Taoyuan. Tell us what you have there. Take it over. 
Well, thank you, Jen Wai, and welcome, Wendy, to this adventure, New China, and where we are in Yunnan province, and this New China adventure, and an old favorite, flowers. We are here in the Donan Flower uh, Wholesale Market. This place is unbelievable. It is gigantic, and this is where flowers are sold uh, to buyers that really, they go all over uh, this nation. Uh, we've been here for uh, just a couple of hours, and it's just amazing. Uh, my colleague, uh, Taiyuan, I know that you've been eagerly eyeing this little flower ring, so it, it really is something to see these just scores of people uh, selling flowers, and it's only going to get more and more busy as the day moves on. Absolutely. I was told that during the peak season, so for example, before an important holiday, say for, uh, for example, Valentine's Day or New Year's Day or Mother's Day, 12 million flowers could easily change hands in this uh, in this market on any given night. So if you like flowers, this is the place to be. It's the center of China's flower universe. And uh, to discuss more about this flower market, we're joined again by Mr. Victor Gao and Mr. Chen Jiahe. Um, Mr. Chen, let me start with you. We're taking in the scale of the market, but um, it's not just wholesale, is it? It's also online selling. Just now when we walked around this market, we saw um, traders just um, live streaming their little shop online, and we're also seeing auction houses. And a few years down the, the road, auction might change too. It might not be physical auction anymore either. So what does that say about the Chinese society and the Chinese way of doing business nowadays? The e-commerce actually brings a lot of changes. the society more efficient, which means everyone is earning more money. Even the old people who cannot join this new business, they can get more pension from the government because the government is collecting more taxes because of this. Um, also, they have actually come over a lot of obstacles during this uh, past decade. Uh, like shipping the flower, the fresh flower from Yunnan to Beijing, that was almost impossible back 10 years ago. But now it's like cold chain delivery service, you can actually do that. So this actually increased a lot of industries in China. That's driving China away from the fixed asset investment model to the consumption model. It really is amazing. And it's another example of how China is really taking advantage of everything at its fingertips. The tremendous economic strides this nation has made in the last 70 years. And Victor, one thing here, this is the second largest market of its kind in the world, only behind the Netherlands. Uh, but. It's only going to get better for China because they've recently made this a free trade zone. What does that mean and how important is it? Absolutely. I think uh, uh, Kunming is the capital city of Yunnan and uh, Yunnan province is not only important in China but also it radiates into the Southeast Asian nations. Yunnan borders with uh, Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam, for example, and it attracts lots of attention from the neighboring countries. The free trade zone, I would say, will really minimize, if not eliminate, all the tariffs, all the duties, etc., and will make doing business here much easier. And it cuts down on bureaucracy and paperwork significantly, and it will really create a lot of efficiency and enhance productivity for people who buy and sell uh, flowers, and also, for example, doing online trading. And we've seen many of these examples of online trading mm -hmm. and e-commerce in this marketplace. Fascinating things. Amazing. And Victor, before we went on the air, I know that you dropped 15 yuan and bought this bouquet of sunflowers. And really, if people buy flowers anywhere, they're going to be shipped all over this country. So our colleagues in the Northeast, if they're buying flowers, our colleagues in the Southeast, all the flowers they get probably come from here. So, uh, Lindy, next time we see you, we will give you this batch of flowers. Jen Wan, Lindy, back to you guys. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I hope so. I can't wait to receive those. Of course, as you mentioned, Sean, uh, plenty of flowers here too in Guangzhou. It's also known as the Flower City. But indeed, our focus today is on trade. Now let's head to China's northwest province of Heilongjiang. It is one of these six new free trade zones that have been announced over the past month. Our colleagues there in the northeast are following that story. Hello to you, Huao and Jeff. Tell us, what do you have for us? Hello there, Lindy and Jianghua. We are now in Heilongjiang province, which borders Russia. And to be exact, we are heading to 
Harbin, which is the most exciting place in this entire province. I know this is where Jianghua, you are from. So the entire province of Heilongjiang is a key window in China's Belt and Road Initiative. The province uh, is very important to China, Mongolia, Russia economic corridor, one of the six corridors in this massive trend infrastructure project. So for example, the famous city Mudanjiang has been very actively tapping into the dairy market in Russia. Uh, it's just one of the many examples that shows how the economic ties between Heilongjiang and outside world are going. Well, not only the Silk Road project, Heilongjiang is also one of the six newly set up free trade zones, part of the nation's strategy to further reform and open up. Well, the planned zone will transform the city of Harbin into a logistics centre. Well, here to discuss logistics centres and a lot more besides, the one and only Professor Li Yong and Aina Tangan, a political analyst, let's call you for now. <laughs> Economic also. Economic also. Uh, right. <laughs> glad to hear that. Right, let's start with you, Professor Li Yong. Yep. Um, so over the past five years, these free trade zones in China have really exploded, haven't they? I mean, they exactly. attract 600,000 companies. Right. Do you think the one in Heilongjiang will reach that sort of potential? As a matter of fact, I think the number of companies coming to uh, Harbin or the other two uh, cities being selected as the parent, uh, part of the sub uh, area of the uh, pilot zone uh, is not really a, a kind of a measure. It depends very much on you know what kind of industries you are going to focus, what kind of a role you, you are going to to play in the future in terms of or in terms of the reform and opening up. I think Harbin is going to play. The role of a hub uh, for the entire, you know, Heilongjiang economic zone, and the focus in the beginning is to create, you know, the very com competitive institutions, you know, benchmarking the advanced international rules. And with that, I think, you know, I think many companies, you know, would come and to find their opportunities. And in Harbin, for example. Uh, the focus is going to be, for example, on new generation IT te uh, information technology. It will be on new materials, will be on um, you know, high-end equipment manufacturing, and so on and so forth. So all of those you know, will be the future focus of Harbin and the businesses, you know, if they see or they, they trust the institution, institutional innovation, they are attracted by that and they're convinced, I think they will be coming and invest and probably in the number may not be that many but the size could be larger so uh, you know I, I, I think you know they, they are given this kind of opportunity in about I think uh, three, uh, two or three years we will start to see you know how attractive this is going to be but generally I think you know they are given a free hand you know to do whatever they wish to do and change you know, the, the institutional environment to allow, uh, to create a better operating environment for both domestic investors and international ones. Yes, indeed. And some experts uh, have estimated that the bilateral trade between China and Russia may double within the next four years to 200 billion U.S. dollars. Is that too ambitious of a goal to accomplish? And apart from FTZs, you know, what are, what should be done to get us closer to that goal? Well, there are three real areas, and one of them could be very, very important to China, and that is if there is further unrest in the Middle East, if things deteriorate with the U.S., China will need a, a, another source for energy, and that is one of the main exports. But that is not the most desirable. It would be nice to be able to get it from Russia. But agriculture, another area, I mean, uh, last year it, it took up $5 billion uh, U.S. dollars worth of, of uh, agriculture port products came into China. This year it's ahead, running ahead about by 24%. So those are big gains, now, but it will take quite a while for that to kick in. The third area that's of interest is goods from uh, Russia coming into China. The difficulty there is that they, they don't have the branding that American companies have. So they're competing mostly on price, partly on quality. You, you were eating the chocolates the other day. I'm, I'm sure surprised. they thought they were quite excellent. So it, it's a question of that. From the Chinese side, obviously there are opportunities there for manufactured goods, which you're seeing is a lot of um, rapeseed, things like this, coming across 
from Russia being processed in China and then shipped not only to Russia but all places around on the Belt and Road Initiative. So there's a lot of opportunities. It would be great if it was balanced. Uh, China, because of its manufacturing prowess, has a lot more uh, you know, opportunities in the upscale market, in the resources, obviously, Russia has tremendous uh, potential. So Russian goods, manufacturing, and agriculture, a lot of areas to be explored. And of course, we're just putting into Harbin now, and there's, there's a massive Russian influence in terms of restaurants and bars architecture, and all that kind of thing, architecture. I haven't seen any Russian, oh yes, yes we have. Look, that looks, uh, some of the architecture of there looks very much like um, Manjoli, doesn't it? The, yeah. the, the spire is very sort of Russian influence. Well, uh, we're going to uh, find our hotel now in the middle of Harbin and then look for something to eat. Very important. <laughs> so we're going to We're back now. to the eating again. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, we're going to hand you back to Lidium Tangana and Li Tianhua down in the southeast. How are you getting on, guys? Hi, Jeff and Guiao, thank you very much. And hopefully you enjoy your time in Harbin, which is my hometown. And you're about to arrive pretty soon, right? And it's also good to see that that place is going to have its pilot freight free zone pretty soon. Okay, so let's come back to the southeastern part of China. What most of African businessmen in China do is importing Chinese goods to their country. But now, in the southern Chinese city of Guangzhou, a Tanzanian national is doing the opposite, and he's exporting cassava to China. CGTN's Ho Weiwei meets the man and had this story. My name is uh, John, John Rombiza, I'm uh, from Tanzania. I first came to China in uh, 1987. We started uh, exporting cassava business from 2015. Africa is importing quite a lot, but exporting very little to China. I thank President Xi Jinping's support to Africa very much. After he came to Tanzania, when he took office, Tanzania, we are lucky that we are given about 97% of the agro products can come to China duty free. At the moment we are doing the, the dried chips. By the end of this year we want at least to have uh, shipped no, no, 150,000 tons to China. So John, this is your office? Oh yeah, this is uh, our office with a Chinese mm -hmm. partner mm -hmm. called uh, Shrine Investment. Mm -hmm. And in fact we have another office in Tanzania mm -hmm. with the partner as well. And we have a factory there. We have some farms, mm -hmm. as you, you can see here. These yeah. are some of our outgrowers. Mm -hmm. They are all in Tanzania. Mutually, they are benefiting because China has a very big appetite for cassava. We have so many farmers in Tanzania, but they are not benefiting from it. We cultivate cassava quite a lot. We have a very big land and cassava can grow everywhere, but then was neglected for so long time. With the business we are doing, with our coming, they are going to earn quite a lot. They were saying they'll be able at least to have some decent houses. The kids will go to school. They'll have uh, transport, motorbikes. They do quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. They're very happy. Especially China is uh, being a very good partner. Well, let's dive deeper now into this issue of trade. And to help us do that, we're joined by our experts. Firstly, right next to me is Haile Seydin. He's the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in South China. And of course, if you have been following us, you'll recognize Ms. Hanhua, a familiar face, our resident uh, analyst, the president of the Beijing Belt and Road Cooperative Community. Uh, Hanhua, I want to start with you. Um, we know, of course, that China's history in terms of foreign trade has come to this point where it is doing really, really well. Well, but perhaps there are still some shortcomings. So in your view, how can China improve its investment uh, environment? And also, I'd like to know just how China can actually help uh, rather do better in terms of attracting foreign talent. Let me review with uh, let me review with you about uh, the short history of China foreign investment. Uh, 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 ever since the opening up and the reform about 40 years ago, the China's foreign investment introduction has been an integral part of this opening up and the reforming process. And uh, still until up to until now, China remains the top 
leading country in the world about introducing the foreign investment to today. And the horizontally and vertically, Chinese legal environment, China's talents nurturing system, as well as other many various areas have been, have been growing along with the foreign investment introduction. And at this junction of the period of time, China needs to do more. And this adds another new factor of this formula, the secret formula of success, which is to opening the new initiative of introducing the foreign investment. For example, five years ago, we announced this Belt and Road Initiative. I think it created a very sustainable and long-term platform to introduce foreign investment in a more broader and uh, deepen uh, perspective and the spectrum of in, uh, introducing foreign investment. And also we have this most recent Great Bay Area Development Plan, plus the pioneering trade zone for both Shenzhen and Guangzhou as the engine of this Great Bay Area Development. And also the pioneering uh, experimental zone for Shenzhen in particular to to introduce not only the foreign investment and the foreign talents as well. Having said this, I want to add, this is never a one-way street. It has to be two-way. So sometimes the foreign investment into China can be then turned into our Chinese investment into the overseas world. And then it created a natural and very organic flow for the, for the money to be flow in and flow out to create more opportunities for all the business in the world. I think this is very important to, to, to bear in mind. And also I want to add that we all, probably you have seen the most recent documentary, which is called American Factory, Chairman Cao De Wang, who is a leading a businessman in China is investing in the United States to create to to uh, uh, about the auto glass uh, manufacturing. But his success is thanks to this foreign investment into his community first to make him a successful businessman. Mm -hmm. I think uh, right so that business when it comes to business or trade is never one way, it's two ways, right? So it, which leads to my question. So how they said in so what do you thing that we need to do to further uh, promote trade. So I've got some of them, some of the comments. So export trade rebate to port infrastructure or customs clearance facilitation. So what do you think? Well, certainly uh, China is taking new steps almost every year, every few months to try to improve uh, conditions for foreign investment in China, improve uh, two-way trade, uh, certainly custom uh, rapid Custom facilitation is one way to uh, assist foreigners who import into China. Uh, deregulation is very important. Uh, one of the things that uh, is going to be extremely helpful is uh, in March of this year, uh, National People's Congress passed the new foreign investment law. The new foreign investment law creates many new steps that make life easier for foreign investors. One of them is the new mechanism for complaint uh, for foreign companies. And this is a mechanism that did not exist before. It was very difficult for a, comp a foreign company to lodge a complaint uh, if they were wrong at the local level. Uh, this new mechanism allows the complaint by foreign companies to be funneled through Beijing, mm -hmm. through the central government, where there is an oversight, and therefore uh, we can uh, uh, look at having a very fair and hearing. Uh, fair hearing uh, regarding any complaints that we might have. Uh, even President Xi Jinping alluded to that uh, as it relates to IPR. There are much new protection areas in place for IPR protection. That is really going to help uh, uh, make foreign companies comfortable in importing their products and, and their technology into China. So there's always steps being taken by the Chinese government that make things easier. Uh, we are standing here just a block from here is the very first uh, American Chamber of Commerce tower in the world, in the history of the world, established right here in this beautiful Bajo area. And that says a great deal for the vibrant, vibrant uh, uh, state of business that exists right here on this island and the Bajo and uh, in, in this area that can really help. It's an example that the rest of the country can follow.
Yeah. Yeah, we well, do look forward to talking to you more about that, but unfortunately, we have to leave it there for now. That's right. Thank you very much, Halit Sayadin, and also you. Hanhua, as always. Okay, so that's all for today's new China show on global business, and that's all we have for today. Back to you, Jun Feng. Thank you so much, Jun Hua and Lindy, and uh, to our colleagues in Heilongjiang and Kunming. I envy you guys because you not just get to travel around the country, but also eat around the country. It's a dinner time, so have something nice to eat. Now let's take a look at the second day of the special series, uh, New China. Our Northeast team visited grasslands in Inner Mongolia and discussed environment preservation. The Southwest team moved its studio into an exhibition center in Guiyang, where they learned about artificial intelligence. And our Southeast team explored the natural beauty of uh, Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. In 70 years, China has undergone unprecedented transformation. From its old industrial base in the northeast to its new manufacturing powerhouse in the southeast and to its emerging southwest, CGTN offers you a panoramic view of contemporary China. Our crews will travel along three different routes and come to you live from dozens of locations and free mobile studios. Join us for an all-inclusive look at China on our TV channel and digital platforms, September the 9th to the 20th. It is New China, then and now, in celebration of the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, only on CGTN.